The video conference deposition of Dr. Tanya Warner has been released. This was the state's expert. We're going to find out what she was really thinking in today's video. Hello, Silva Squad, and welcome back to the Silva. The Silva's back there. I'm right here. My name is Paul if you're new to the channel. If you're not new to the channel, my name's still Paul. I hope you're doing well. We are going to be, this is gonna be maybe a long video, I don't know. We're gonna be doing a read-through of a video deposition of Dr. Tanya Werner. This was the state's expert that we saw with such crazy testimony on the stand. This is done, and again, it's a transcript, right? So it's different people talking. So I'm just gonna read through it. It's 87 pages. So it might take us a minute. So just brace yourselves. I'm going to do a live chat and do a read through of this. So by the time you see this, I would have already done that. So if you want to see how that went, just jump over to the other channel. Links are down below and check it out. What we're going to do here, I'm just going to say this. If you follow me for a while, then you'll know. I'll go into like different kind of characters when I read. Like you might hear Blanche from Golden Girls. You might get whoever that character is in the cartoon of the rooster. I can't think of his name right now. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. It's how I have to get through the day, okay? These are the voices in my head and they just seem to come out. Okay, just know that if I start, they'll be like, what, 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 where did this come from? Well, that's just me. It's my self-diagnosed personality disorders coming through, okay? And on that no, please keep in mind, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a cop, I'm not a therapist, I'm not any of that stuff, okay? I ain't got none of the fancy credentialed stuff up in here. The only credentials we do got is that sofa some size and well my self-diagnosed personality disorders which are probably gonna come out there doing it right now okay so let's go ahead and get started okay so on the screen you're gonna see that first page at the top it says state of florida plaintiff versus sarah boom going on down here you see video conference deposition of tanya werner md okay then we'll go to the next page appearances we hear dave Sitter, sedatory william J. The assistant state attorney, that's his name, James Owens, on behalf of Sarah. Also present is Lakia Cantata, uh, intern. We have the testimony of Tanya Werner. Direct examination by Mr. Owens. Cross examination by Mr. J. Redirect examination by Mr. Owens. And then certificate of reporter, a subscription of deponent. Okay, so. Here we go. Okay. All right. So the video conference deposition of Tanya Warner, MD, was taken on behalf of the defendant on Friday, October 4th, 2024 at 1.04 p.m. and hosted by the Office of Marge Raider Court Reporter. Just list all that stuff there. Now let's get down to there. The reporter opens up. We are swearing in the witness based on the Supreme Court Administrative Order number and it lists the number. Then we get into it. So Tanya Warner, having been first duly sworn by the reporter, testified as follows. Direct examination. So by Mr. Owens. Dr. Werner? Yes, sir. Yes. This is James Owen again. Now, as you know, I represent Sarah Boone. Yes, sir. Would you please state your full name and spell your last? My name is Tanya. T-O-N-I-A. Werner. W-E-R-N-E-R. -E -E and uh, can you give us your address? It lists the address. And what is the name of your facility where you work? Meridian Behavior Healthcare. Now, are you a partner there? Do you, like, own the business? No, it's a non-profit. I, I work for them. Now, what do you mean by non-profit? It's a non-profit. Okay, you don't get, like, paid a salary by them? No, I do. It's a non-profit organization. Like, the Salvation Army is a non-profit. It's a non-profit organization. A community mental health center. Okay, now, how long have you worked for them? Almost 10 years since 2015. All right. And what did you do before that? I was at the University of Florida on faculty as an associate professor and the vice chairman of Department of Psychiatry and the director of the Forensic Institute at the University of Florida. Thank you. And how long were you there? From 1998 to 2015 when I retired. And prior to that, prior to that, I was in my psychiatric training. And where was that? I did my residency at the, Co uh, at the Coconut at the Connecticut Valley Hospital hospital in Middleton, Connecticut, under the aus auspices of Yale University. I completely butchered that name. I did four years of training there, and then I came to the University of Florida and did a one-year fellowship in the forensic psychiatry, and I am board certified in general and forensic psychiatry. And what did you do prior to the residency? I attended medical school. Where did you go to medical school? American University of the Caribbean. American University of the Caribbean? Of the Caribbean, correct. Where's that? 
At the time I went there, it was in Plainview, Texas. I believe now it's on St. Martin, but it had been hit by a hurricane and they had relocated to the mainland of the United States at the time that I attended. Why did you choose that school? I had not. I actually had not finished my undergraduate degree and they accepted me. I got waitlisted at the University of South Florida and they accepted me at the American University of the Caribbean and they were in Texas. And so I just was anxious to go and I went. And now prior to that, during my first semester of medical school, I completed my bachelor's degree. Where did you complete the bachelor's? So I got my bachelor's degree from, it's from the University of South Florida, but I took a couple of courses to complete it through Maryland Baptist University, which is where the medical school was being housed at the time on the mainland. So you were able to complete your bachelor's there in Texas and then stay on the campus for the, and now it comes in here and interrupts, whereupon there was a Zoom technicality after which following transcribed, whereupon the previous question was read by back by the reporter after which the following was transcribed by Mr. Owens. Dr. Werner, I didn't live on campus. I had housing. I had a house that I rented off campus, but our courses, well, we use their facility. We leased, I guess the school leased part of their facility of the university. And who is we? What do you mean who is we? You just said we leased the school. No, then I changed it to the school because I had nothing I had nothing to with it. So I assume the school, at least part of the facility of the Baptist University where we're housed. Okay, okay, so, so you got accepted. You finished off your undergrad, you got accepted. Now the campus was, school was right there. So you just started, you just started your postgraduate. Correct. I did my first two years, you know, in a classroom, learning there in Texas, and then went to Connecticut and did all of my clinicals in Connecticut. Okay, now as it relates to Sarah Boone, my client, obviously we understand that you evaluated her. Was it yesterday, day before? What are we talking about? Day before yesterday, correct. Okay, and that was at the Orange County Jail? Yes. And that was with two prosecutors and myself. That's correct. How long was the evaluation? It was approximately two hours and 20 minutes. And did you do any testing? I did a mental status examination. And when, what is that mental status examination called? A mental status examination. That's it? That's it. That's what we called it. And what else do you do besides that test? Interviewed her. Is that customary in the field? Yes. Now, how long have you been on this case? Oh, I'm not sure when they first contacted me, in all honesty. Well, the event occurred in February of 2020. I was. Do you know? Do you know if? No, I was. Do you know if you were contacted during the year of 2020? No, sir, I was not. I was contacted this calendar year. So you haven't been involved in the case at all until 2024? That's correct. I seem to remember that they had retained an expert, a potential rebuttal expert prior to me coming in. I came in on the case in late August of 2024. I seem to recall that they had already had a rebuttal witness. You were not involved in any way prior to me coming in in August of 2024? Oh, I'm not sure. I've said this calendar year, which is 2024. So I very well may have been on board before you came on. Yeah. Do you have any notes that would like reflect? Do you have any notes that would reflect in your file about when you came on? It would probably be in my calendar somewhere where I first had a phone conference with them or in an email. I'll have to look for it. Can you check? Can you check that and get back to me? Either me or the prosecutor about when you first came on the case? Yes. All right, all right, all right. And, and what all What all did you do to get up to speed on the case? To be able to evaluate her and then diagnose her and then render opinions. So, I reviewed some documents that were referred to me, and then I evaluated her at the jail. All right, and how many documents were you asked to review? I was provided with the Orange County Sheriff's Office investigative report. How many pages is that? There are several different printouts. It's 150. Okay. No, I take that back. 50. I have 58 pages of that. Okay. I have a transcript of a taped interview of Sarah Boone. Is that the transcript of the two-hour interrogation at the Orange County Jail? I don't know if it was an interrogation or not. The the title of the document is Transcript of Taped Interview of Sarah Boom. It was from April, or I'm sorry, February 24th of 2020. How many pages was that? Again, there's several different printouts, and it is, the last page I have is 177. Okay, now what other documents did you review? I have a, another transcript of a taped interview of Sarah Boone. This one I have dated as February 25th, and that one's 394 pages. But it, it may be a continuation of the other ones because it's not dated at the top. I, I hand wrote that on. So I, 
I don't know. Let me see at the back if I got it from the back of it, where I got the date from. No, it's not dated on the back either. So I'm not sure where I got that from. That may be miswritten. And it may have also been part of the, of the February 24th one. Uh, okay, go ahead. Then I have medical records from Aspire Health and I have, hold on, the medical records. Number four document was the medical records from Aspire Health. Who was treated in those records? Sarah Bone. And do they have the dates of the treatment? October 25th, 2018. And the last one is, or the first one is January 23rd, 2018. Okay, I believe that was number four, the medical records. Which next? Then I have the medical records from Seox Health. Spell Seox, C-I-O-X. So this is the Advent Health, it looks like. Who was the patient? Sarah Bone. What's the dates there? January 13th, 2020 was the first one. And let me make sure. January 23rd, 2018 was the last date it appears. Here's another one from, well, because they're not in order, I guess. July 2009, I mean. I don't have the dates written down, so I'm flipping through it. Was that for some tab of psychological. That was an emergency room. I've lost that page already. Some of them are psychiatric and some of them are not. July 2009 was an emergency room visit and she was started on slimidopin and antibiotics. So I doubt that was psychiatric. Okay, anything else about them records? No. All right, now what else did you review? Then there were printed out, two printed out sections of, it looks like text messages and location pings off a cell phone, I assume. They're not labeled. It's just, there's just two of them. And what are the date, beginning and ending of both of them? One starts on December 25th, 2019 and goes through February 24th, 2020. And those text messages from Sarah's phone, you know what? The numbers aren't labeled. So I would assume so from reading the text messages, but it's not labeled that way. Can you tell when Sarah is texting and when someone else is responding back? Well, it says who, what number it's coming from. So it shows like if it's going from that phone or to the phone, yes. So there is a way to tell that, but I can't tell you who's texting. Were you able to tell when Sarah was texting. When the messages were coming from her phone, what I assumed to be her phone, yes. Yeah. Now, you considered that in your evaluation? No. You're asking me what I reviewed. I'm telling you what I reviewed. Okay. Okay. You didn't consider these text messages in your evaluation. I was aware of them, but they're not necessarily overly relevant. Okay. So the first set was from December 25th, 2019 to February 24th, 2020. Correct. And then the second set of text, February 15th, 2018 through December 23rd, 2019. And did you consider those text messages in your evaluation? I mean, I read through them, so I'm aware what's in there. And I'm aware that they, you know, had relationship issues and that she was, you know, taking pictures and that they were fighting over the text. And, you know, I'm aware of the relationship issues going on back and forth via reading the text. Was there anything from them text messages that stuck out to you that caused you to pause and feel like you may have some impact on your evaluations? No, as I said, it made me aware that they had a volatile relationship. I mean, in some of them, there are capital letters coming from her cursing at him, calling him an idiot, an effing idiot for overdrafting. And, you know, there's some referring to domestic violence and, you know, injuries. I mean, there are different text messages in there that demonstrated they had a violent relationship, a volatile relationship. Would you consider that in your evaluation? Of course. Okay. Okay. Anything that sticks out to you other than what you've indicated? No. All right, all right, okay. What else did you review? That's it. Okay, so I've got the number one, I've got the investigative report that you said was 58 pages. Number two, I've got a transcript that was of Sarah Boone, an interview with Sarah Boone that was 177 pages. Number three, I've got a transcript that was an interview of Sarah Boone. That's 394 pages. And then number four, I've got the medical records from Aspire Health. That patient was Sarah Boone and the dates were from January to October 2018. Okay, now there's more. Number five, I've got medical records for where Sarah Boone was the patient at Seox Health or Advent Health and it looks like the records were from potentially July 2009 maybe all the way up to January 13, 2020. And then number six, I know a number six, I've got a printout of the text message 
vintages. Two sets. One that are from December of 2019 to February 2020, which you believe you interpret the messages that came from Sarah Boone. And then a second set from, no, that's misstating what I said. Well, I, I, all right, I'll settle down. Tell me what, tell me what you mean then. I said that I can tell which messages come from the phone that's attributed to Sarah Boone. I did not say that I knew they came from Sarah. <laughs> Do you have any reason to believe they wouldn't have come from Sarah? The ones that you attributed to her phone. I have no idea who typed them in. How would I know? Okay, okay now. But there is nothing, okay, there is nothing to indicate that. That to you, they wouldn't have come from Sarah if they were from Sarah's phone, correct? I would assume so, but I'm not, I mean, I'm not stating that I know they came from Sarah. I, I, I understand. I understand. Okay. You've been advised that that's the number that was Sarah Booth's phone number. Nobody told me that. I assumed from when I received the records and then reviewing them that that was her phone number. Okay. That this is Sarah's phone number. Okay. Okay. And then it looked like there was a second set of printout of text messages was from February 15th of 2018 to December 23rd, 2019. And they appeared to be text messages relating to Sarah. Sarah Boone's phone as well. Correct. The same number. Okay, and from that last n number six, the printout of the text messages, when you determined that they were having relationship issues or a, a volatile relationship, they were fighting, there were pictures that would indicate it was a volatile relationship. Okay, yes, there were descriptions of things. Anything else you can glean from them text messages? Those two sets of text messages about Sarah Boone or no? Okay. Anything else that you reviewed? No, sir. Have you reviewed any video tapes? I have not. Have you reviewed any audio tapes? I have not. Have you reviewed the autopsy reports? I have not. Okay. It may have been in the investigative. Hang on, because I'm. It, it, it may have been in with the investigative report. I know I've seen at least a description of it at some point. So described in the incident report. No, I don't see it in here. So I, I know it. It was probably described in here when they went back to talk to her the second day, because I know they talked about it with her. Okay, now, okay. And did you receive any medical records from George Torres? No, I did not. And explain to me exactly what your title is. I'm the chief med medical officer. And, and what does that mean? It means that I'm in charge of all the medical staff. Is your job basically like administrative duties? That's a portion of it. But that's probably the smallest part of my job. Well then... What other parts of your job besides that small portion for administration? Yes, so, I work seven days a week on the Crisis Stabilization Unit in Lake City, Florida. I run that unit. We have approximately 30 patients there that I see during the week and on the weekends and holidays. Now, are those, go ahead, are those patients that have come in over the weekend that are in some form of like a, a crisis? They come in and out, yes sir. Okay. Now, is there a limited amount of time that they can stay at the facility in Lake City? There's no specific limited amount of time. We are a short-term treatment facility. We are a Baker Act receiving facility. So majority of our patients are on Baker Act. Our average length of stay is typically probably three to five days. We do have some outliers that do stay much longer than that. If we're holding them specifically to like transfer to another facility, such as one of the state hospitals, they'll end up staying longer than that. But our typical patients, They'll only stay, you know, three, I would say three to five days, maybe a week, long enough. That would be, would it be fair to say that probably like 95% of the patients at that facility stage a short term? It's actually probably 60 to 65%. Okay. And would you treat them by talking to them in medication? Correct. We have therapists, we have recreational therapy, we have psychotherapy, we have medical management with them, we do family therapy. So we try to address all of their issues. Okay. Now, so how much of your work? How much of your workload would you say is attributed to Lake City Crisis Stabilization Facility? 
guarantee. Well, Monday through Friday, I'm there 50% of my time. So every morning, and then I'm there on the weekends, in the morning also. So more than 50% of my time is related to that. All right. Now, what is the other, what's the other time? My forensic work. Now, what do you mean by forensic work? So forensic psychology is an area of psychiatry where psychiatry intersects with the law. So anytime there's like a legal case that has some sort of psychiatric question, whether it be in the civil arena or on the criminal arena. Are you a psychiatrist? Yes, sir. Okay, so now I know that we've got a couple of experts on our side. Dr. Julie Harper, do you know her? I do not. Do you know what her title is? I believe she's a psychologist, isn't she? I think a forensic psychologist and the other expert we've got, he, Dr. Michael Brandon, do you know him? I do not. Okay, do you know what his title is? I do not. I think he's a forensic psychologist as well. Okay. Do you explain to me what the difference is between your your position as a forensic psychiatrist and their position as a forensic psychologist? So I'm an MD and they're not. What are they? They're oh, they can be PsyDs, they can be uh, PhDs, but they're not MDs. They didn't go to medical school, so they typically do. Mm, psychologists typically do therapy, but they don't prescribe medication or understand medical issues, so to speak. Yeah. But they typically do testing, psychological testing and therapy. Is there a big difference in the roles, the two separate roles, psychiatrist and psychologist, and their roles for what? For treatment? In the forensic field, sure. We're both asked to do evaluations. They do. They do testing, psychological testing when it's indicated, which is not always indicated. If there is cognitive issues going on, they can do that. Or personality issues. They can come into play with regards to psychological testing. It can be helpful. There, where we have a better understanding of the medications and any medical aspects of the individuals. Okay. Now, then you said that you were, you said you do administrative roles and you said that you did like 50% or more of your work is at the Lake City, Florida Crisis Stability Center. And then you said you do forensic work as a forensic psychiatrist. What percentage of your work is as a forensic psychiatrist? I have no idea. It's probably 45%. And would that be... That would involve, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, 45% of your work is forensic psychiatry. Probably 50-50, it just depends on the week in all honesty. Because if I have a trial going on or a lot of depositions or, you know, traveling to Orlando to see somebody, then, you know, I shift things around. More time may be dedicated this week to forensic work as opposed to, you know, I, I may have somebody cover a patient one day. So I do less clinical work this week. It just, it just depends on week to week. So as a forensic psychiatrist doing this forensic work, is it mostly related to competency to proceed? I do a lot of competency to proceed, yes. I also do a lot of guardianship evaluations. Those are probably the majority of the of the work that I do in all honesty. Now, guardianship evaluations, I assume that's where families have filed some, some petition with the court that one of their family members doesn't have the ability to care for themselves or manage their affairs for themselves and they're asking the court to, to make a determination and appoint one of the family members to oversee. Yes, typically it's the family that files, or more recently, it's been facilities. So I think there have been some kind of change in their ability to get reimbursed from different payer sources unless they seek guardianship of individuals. So if there are individuals in their facility that don't have families, the facilities will file to have a guardianship and to have a guardian appointed. So if they're in like a nursing home or somewhere like that. Correct, yes. Okay. And literally over the last two years, the majority of the evaluations have been coming from facilities and it's been a high number. So I think something has changed with regards to their payer sources, honestly. So what percentage would you say of your forensic psychiatry is related to either guardianships or the competency proceedings? Oh, I don't know. I don't keep track of it that way, in all honesty. Well, go on, take your best guess. Probably half of my forensic work is made up by those two. All right. And what's the other half? I do sanity at the time of the crime. I do competency to be executed evaluations. I'm appointed by the governor to do those. I do personal injury cases. I do medical malpractice. I did a lot of the tobacco cases against big tobacco. So just any number, anything in the... Okay, now, have you ever testified in court? 
numerous times, yes. How many times would you say you testified? Oh, hundreds, if not over a thousand. And numerous, lots. In criminal cases, criminal and civil, yes. What percentage of the times you've testified were in criminal cases? In court, oh, gosh, I'm not sure. In all honesty, I have no idea. Would it be less than 20? No, 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 no. It's give us a, I'd be, I, I'm guessing, okay. I, I'm completely guessing it would probably be like 60%. Okay, and, and, and is that mainly incompetency to proceed tax cases? Mainly because those are the most common, although I have to say that they are not, they did not used to be the most common, and that they're the most common evaluations I do, but they were not typically the most common evaluations that would have testimony, because in the past they would get three evaluations and not have testimony, but here more recently they've only been doing two evaluations and having testimony. A lot of times you wouldn't testify, you just like submit a report. Correct. And that would be be sufficient. It would be accepted by both parties. Your opinions, yes. Okay. And then you said you've done some work outside of the criminal arena. You said that's about 50% of the work you do. Of the of the civil work. Again, I'm guessing. It's so I, I don't remember what percentage I assigned to that because I'm, I'm just guessing. Okay. Oh, that's fine now. In the criminal cases, do you testify primarily for the state? I'm called by both sides. Alright. Now, how many times have you been called by the defense as a witness in trial? <sighs> Gosh, I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea. I, I've been doing this for 20 something years. I, I have absolutely no idea. You don't keep any kind of record. No, sir. Are you asked about that from time to time by lawyers about work you've done? Yes. Okay, in criminal cases, what opinions are you asked to render? I think we just went through that, but I mean, competency to proceed, sanity at the time of crime. Okay, and you think the percentage that you testify for the state's about 50-50 with the time you've spent testifying for the defense. It's probably more weighted towards the state, the times. It depends on your question. So the times that I've been hired is probably more weighted towards state. The times that I've been te that I've testified, I have actually no idea because again, a lot of the times I don't testify. Okay, okay. And what have you been? You said you've testified as an expert. Have you testified, I assume, as an expert those hundreds of times? Almost a thousand times as an expert? Yes, I also testify every week and as a treating physician through our Baker Act Court. Okay. Now, well, I'm referring right now to criminal trials in which there is a jury that's been impaneled. Sure. What would you qualify as an expert to testify about? I've been qualified to testify with regards to psychiatric issues, anything under the umbrella of forensic psychiatry. So any types of psychiatric issue that they, they're having questions about, competency questions, diagnosis. Well, I, I know when, usually in criminal case it would involve competency or either insanity. Correct. Are there any other ways that you would be allowed to testify in a criminal case other than for competency or insanity. I've done mitigation and aggravating factors. You're talking about it, sentencing. Correct, correct, and, and criminal. Okay, now, and so you would testify what you would be aggravating factors in terms of forensic psychology. I, I wouldn't know. You would you would have to ask a forensic psychologist. Forensic, oh, I'm sorry, I, I apologize. Forensic psychologist, psychiatrist, psychiatrist. What would be aggravating? It could be anything. It could be anything. So you would have to, well, give me an example. You would have your statutory aggravating factors and you have, you know, non-statutory aggravating factors. So it would it be, would it be some kind of diagnosis that you would give? No, no. I can comment on their upbringing, their educational background. Any of those issues are factors. You never, you never called to testify as diagnosing somebody with some type of personality trait. Yes, yes, I can be. As an aggravator or a mitigator? Yes. That can also be an aggravator or a mitigator, sure. Okay, now as it relates to that diagnosis with some type of personality, how often are you asked to do that? Every case, as even a competency, ask for a diagnosis. Okay, and what are, what are the general diagnoses 
in those cases. Ugh, there's no general diagnosis. Each individual is different. I don't go in with any kind of notion that there is a general diagnosis. Each individual is different. Can you give me one diagnosis that you would render in a criminal case? Schizophrenia, alcohol use, alcohol abuse, or use. There is no diagnosis of alcohol abuse anymore. We, we don't use that. It's alcohol use disorder. It's, it's the official diagnosis. Okay, so schizophrenia or alcohol use disorder any other types of diagnoses. There are thousands of them. Anything in the DSM-5-TR is it's fair game. Any diagnosis, I, I understand, but there seems to be... Hold on, let me think. There would seem to be there was some kind of common diagnosis, okay, you would have in the criminal realm would come up before, before a jury. Antisocial personality disorder, but each individual is different. Some have some of those and some don't have those. Are you allowed to render those type of opinions before a jury? Yes. Okay, so I've got schizophrenia, we got alcohol use disorder, we got antisocial personality disorder, okay. Anything else that is common, fairly common diagnosis on your part in a criminal case. You just ask me, are there any diagnoses? I'm not telling you there are common ones on my part. Each individual is different. I, I said this. So e, I approach them, I evaluate them, and diagnose them based on presentation that they have. Okay. Now, anything else you want to say about your testimony that you feel that makes you an expert in the field in which you're about to render opinions? No, I'm happy to answer any other questions that you have. Have you ever testified in a battered spouse syndrome? situation? I have. How many times? I think I've testified recently to the fact it was between five and ten times, but after I testified to that and thinking about it, it's actually involved in a lot of cases where it actually isn't the kind of main focus of the case. So I think that number is higher than that. All right. Now, but you believe the fair estimate would be between five and ten times? And no, I just said I believe it's more than that. Okay, but you've testified that somebody suffers as a battered spouse. Suffers or done it under that syndrome. Correct. So if it's not five to ten, what would the number be? I'm not sure. Again, I didn't keep track of that over the however long I've done that. But a lot of, you know, intimate violence cases involved. Would you say under 20? I'm not sure. Well, ma'am, you've got to give me some type of number. I'm not sure. Would you say under 50? Yes, uh, probably under 50. Okay, so you think you've testified about battered spouse syndrome in 50 cases before a jury. I didn't say before a jury. It may have been a bench trial. I said that, and it, and it might have been a deposition. But I believe I've testified with regards to that, yes. Okay, in front of a jury, how many times have you testified as an expert about battered spouse syndrome? No idea. Would it be less than 10? I have absolutely no idea. I'd be guessing. I mean, I'm just guessing at these numbers. I have no idea. Well, how long have you been rendering opinions that people suffer from battered spouse syndrome? Since my training. Excuse me? Since my training in 1998, it's been we were trained on it. All right. Well, what training have you received regarding battered spouse syndrome? So, we've received training on it during our psychiatric residency and then during my... I'm very active in the Florida Psychiatric Society and I actually presented numerous times on domestic violence at their meetings. All right, now tell me about the training at the psych at the psychiatric residence. Uh, what was the training regarding battered spouse? Just generalized training, just like you, you learn about antidepressants, we learn about generalized anxiety disorder. So we have training that's, was there a clash on that or just like seminars or something? Yes, we've had seminars, we've had lectures during the week as residents. Okay, all right. We'd go to lecture, lecture series, and we would have been lectured on that, correct? So during that psychiatric, dur during the psychiatric residency. How much time did you spend on lectures on battered spouse syndrome? Oh, I, I, I have no idea. There was like 20 years ago. No idea. Would you say less than 10 hours? 
I have no idea. Okay. Would it be possible it was less than 10 hours? No, not over a four year period of time. No. Okay. You didn't take any class on battered spouse syndrome, did you? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Did you take a course during your psychological residency that was on battered spouse syndrome? I didn't do a psychological residency. I did a psychiatric residency. And yes, we had. That's what I'm telling you. It was part of our lecture series. Yes. Okay. And then you mean in Florida Psychiatric Society. That's correct. And what training did you receive in regards to that? I didn't. I gave the training. Oh, on battered spouse syndrome? On domestic violence. That was included in the training, correct? All right. Where did you learn about battered spouse syndrome? I think we just talked about it and I also did research online with my presentation partner. So we would update our slides because we did the presentation. So as part of your licensing for the state of Florida to maintain your medical license, you have mandatory continued medical education courses that you have to take. And one of them is a two hour domestic violence course that you have to complete every two years when you renew your license. And so we would present it every two years at the Florida Psychiatric Society meetings to provide that for our members, that education so that they would have have that for their relicensing. And we did that for probably four or five cycles before we handed that off to someone else to do the presentation. So you would actually do the presenting to other medical professionals for their CMEs or for their credits or domestic violence. That's correct. Okay. Do you have those slides or PowerPoints? I do not. Dr. Jennery may have them still because we stopped doing it about four years ago, I believe. We handed that off. I can see if Dr. Jennery still has them. Is he with your office? She, no. She is a psychiatrist at North Florida Regional Medical Center. Is that in uh, Jacksonville? No, sir. It's here in Gainesville. Okay. And spell her last name. G-I-N-O-R-Y. Okay, okay. Now, all right. Okay, now, as it relates to Sarah Boone, do you have any diagnosis as it relates to her? No. She told me she was previously diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder, so that would be in there. She's being prescribed an antioxidant for the help to help treat her symptoms. Whether it is a generalized dis anxiety disorder versus an adjustment disorder to her being in the facility is questionable for me, in all honesty. But I haven't had time to go through everything thoroughly since I just saw her her two days ago and process everything in all honesty. I think she has also narcissistic personality traits was evidence in the evaluation. And those would be my two major diagnoses. So the, uh, from my understanding, what you just said was the, uh, I agree with the general anxiety disorder and that she has been diagnosed with. No, I said it would be a generalized anxiety disorder versus an adjustment disorder and that I haven't had time to fully formulate that opinion out. What, what do you need? I need time to go through my notes and think about it and process it. But I had other depositions as you're aware yesterday, so I had to prepare for those and go through that. So I have not had time to process through all my notes prior to this deposition today. Well, doctor, I'm not trying to inconvenience you or nothing, okay? You know the judge set for October 7th for the jury selection. Election. Okay, but I, I don't anticipate your testimony will be in, until later. You know, maybe we could discontinue your deposition and then reset it when you've got time to review. Because obviously, I, I'm not going to want to take your deposition and then you have other opinions that are not going to be covered. Mr. J, what is your position? Mr. J chimes in. Conducting discovery after the jury trial starts is completely unacceptable to me. So that's my position. If she needs to issue a supplemental report or if there becomes a need for a second deposition, then we can address that. But it would be my position that we need to get this done because the state doesn't have any appealant rights once jury. The jury is sworn and jeopardy attaches. Mr. Owen continues. Well, you obviously understand my position. Okay, I'd like to finish the deposition today as well, personally, okay? But uh, if she is holding out that she may have other opinions and other diagnoses after she has time to think, review the paperwork, then obviously that will, that creates an issue, the witness. But if that happens, I can bring that forward and then you can add it to your deposition at that point. If my opinions change after having reviewed further, Mr. Owens. Mr. J, 
Mr. J chimes in. I think we need to plow ahead. This is our time with her. The court reporter is prepared to give us a transcript by the end of the weekend. And if something needs to be amended, then she can A, issue a report, and then B, if she need to take a deposition, an abbreviated deposition, on the limited subject matter she is not prepared to testify about to on today, then we can do that. But the notion of halting a deposition today that is set for three hours and then doing a three hour deposition during trial, especially after Jeopardy is attached is it's not what the state would do, Mr. Owens. I'm not suggesting that, Mr. J, okay? I I'm not suggesting what you just said at the very beginning, which is let's finish. But if she has some supplement, then I would want to take a brief second deposition, okay, as it relates to any new diagnoses or opinions. Okay, now completely side note here, y'all. I just I have to say this because I'll forget it. Isn't this fascinating to hear that this was already brought up already a thing like they were both going on about this before it even happened like then we see it happen in court mr owens acted like this was this whole oh my god we've never done do a deposition in court they were already talking about this right and then uh, uh, to be fair mr owens was warning jay i need a b and c so that this doesn't happen so fascinating to see this take place right here okay let's continue mr jay continues okay what i'm understanding here to see is right now there has been a previous diagnosis of an adjustment disorder and some of the records she just needs to review her records to see if she thinks that is the best diagnosis that she would give as opposed to a generalized anxiety diagnosis am i misstating that dr warner the witness it it actually you flipped them Mr. J. Okay. So she's, the witness continues. So she's saying she has a generalized anxiety disorder and I'm saying I want to review it more to see if I think it's more of an adjustment disorder to being in the correctional setting right now and the stressors that she is under right now as opposed to a generalized anxiety disorder. Mr. J continues. Okay. So on this topic, if something new comes up, then we can address it. But if we have other topics to dispose her on, then I would suggest we go on. Mr. Owens continues, I agree, I agree. And, and Dr. Warner, l just let the state attorney know, okay? I know that you may be, you know, we're on short time. If uh, if you do review your notes over the weekend uh, or whatnot and formulate any other opinions, just let the state attorney know. We'll, we'll address it. Absolutely. Okay, so, so my understanding is you believe that she does suffer from either like generalized anxiety disorder, which is consistent with what she's already been diagnosed with or like an adjustment to the jail time is some kind of like anxiety disorder correct okay okay and then you base that on your interview with her plus the test that you gave her my interview and her description of her presentation and what's going on with her and how she's felt being since being in the correctional setting correct Okay, and that test you gave was the only test you gave to her? Correct. I did a mental status examination. Oh, okay. And so you said that she believed she suffered from one of those, and that's your diagnosis. And then you mentioned narcissism, okay? And that she meets some of the traits of narcissism, narcissistic personality disorder traits. Correct. Okay, now tell me what, what criteria she exhibits that tends to meet her as a narcissist. Just her presentation, the way she described some of her milestones in life and herself and her actions was in an overly kind of self-grandiose manner, so to speak. Like when I asked her, for example, how far she had gone at school, rather than say I'm a high school graduate, she said, well, I was about to sit for the entrance exams for college when my father died, so. Now, what does that indicate to you by stating it in that way instead of just answering? Hey, I graduated from high school. What's that mean? Again, it's some kind of grandiose manner of saying I only graduated from high school. I didn't go to college. But she's talking about, you know, she was going to go to college as opposed to answering the question. She had some insecurities because she didn't go to college. But she presents it in a different light. So she was, the majority of her employment was as a receptionist type job, which she would describe as being a front desk person. And then she continued to always describe herself almost every single position as the assistant to the office manager or the assistant to the owner of the company. 
company. So it was kind of elevating her position, although she was kind of that front desk person by her description, okay? So these are just examples. And the manner that she described kind of her relationship, when she started to describe her relationship with her ex-husband and with George, there were ways that she described herself and her role in those relationships that she was kind of elevating herself. It was just a number of ways that she, just descriptive ways that she used throughout the evaluation of herself that appeared to have narcissistic traits. And I heard you say how she answered the questions about her education, about, you know, she answered the question about her employment, about how she answered the question about her relationship with her ex-husband and George Torres. What other criteria would tend to indicate that she was a uh, narcissist? I didn't say that she was. I said that she has narcissistic traits and that was the examples. That was the examples that I gave. All right, all right. Now, do you have any other criteria that she has like a narcissistic type trait? No, it was just how she presented herself. Uh, okay, so that's all you saw that relates to any criteria that she may be have, be have narcissism. As I sit here today without sitting down and specifically going through my notes, yes. Okay, so do you think she suffers from a personality disorder? I did not diagnose her with a personality disorder. Did you feel like she met any of the criteria that would tend to support a diagnosis for a personality disorder? Well, we just went through one of the criteria for the narcissistic personality disorder. That is a personality disorder. Uh, okay. Uh, any other criteria that you felt like she might have some, you know, me some other disorder? No. Okay, do you feel like she suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder? She didn't give me criteria with regards to that. She discussed having fear and anxiety of his family and fear that they would come into the jail or have someone else come into the jail and harm her. She talked about that. And she spoke about, you know, having recollections, remembering abuse from George during the evaluation. But those were the things that she spoke about that would go with that. But you don't believe that she suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder in your opinion. No, I would have to look through the back through my notes to see if she fully met that criteria. Now, can you explain why you don't think she suffers from the post-traumatic stresses disorders? No, I didn't say one way or the other. I, I would have to look back to my notes for that. Is it something that you may in the future give an opinion about after maybe some time reflecting and uh, reviewing your notes. I may. Oh, okay. And, and is that something that you will let the lawyers know about if, if that changes? <laughs> Yes. Now, you have already answered this. You said that you felt like she she met the criteria for this anxiety disorders. And no, she says, so she has the attributes and discussed with me that she has anxiety and symptoms of anxiety. And we discussed that. So whether it is attributed, whether those symptoms are attributable to generalized anxiety disorder, which is what she said she's been diagnosed with in the past, as opposed to an adjustment disorder based on what is going on right now. Now, what would be the criteria that you would look for to determine whether somebody suffered from an anxiety disorder? Again, generalized anxiety, feelings of restlessness, uneasiness, so all of the general symptoms of anxiety, but it's typically related to numerous. Well, with generalized anxiety disorder, the anxiety is not specific to one different, one specific thing. It's generalized just like it says. It can, anything can make you anxious as opposed to an adjustment disorder. It's related to just what's going on right now. Was there any criteria that you felt like she exhibited that would indicate that she suffered from anxiety disorder? Well, again, I think the criteria over, I think the symptoms, the symptoms overlap for the two disorders. And between anxiety and the adjustment disorder, correct. And those are restlessness, uneasiness. Yes, if she has symptoms of anxiety, so whether it's whether it's attributable to an, a generalized anxiety disorder right now, or whether it's just attributable to an adjustment disorder right now, is the question. The actual diagnosis is the question. The symptoms, mm, they aren't the question. Uh, okay, but the criteria would be restlessness, and I heard you say like a uneasiness. Is there any other criteria for anxiety? 
anxiety or adjustment disorder. Yeah, there's there's lots of criteria for anxiety. It can be, you know, an increased heart rate. So any of the feelings of uh, that come along with anxiety, difficulty sleeping, you, you know, decreased appetite, anything that comes along with people being anxious. Okay, there were two videos and you said you didn't watch any video. Okay, there was a video of George Torres lying in the bed and Sarah wants her keys back. Did you have a chance or were you able to hear me just now? I did. Okay, okay. There was a video of George Torres lying in the bed and Sarah wants her keys back. Okay, did you have a chance to review that video or speak to the state attorney about that? No, sir. I saw no videos. Oh, okay. Now, you heard Sarah talk about her, her the drinking of the alcohols. Yes, I, I asked her about that, correct? Do you have any opinions about that? About alcohol as it relates to Sarah Boone? Yes, I think Sarah Boone has an alcohol use disorder. And that used, or is that what we used to call alcoholism? We've never, we don't use the term alcoholism, but we used to use the term alcohol. Alcohol abuse and alcohol dependency, but those we, we don't use anymore. Now it's alcohol use disorder. How long has that that, that been used as a term, that, that alcohol use disorders? That came into effect with the DSM-5. And so I want to say probably five years now i'd have to look and your diagnosis your diagnosis says that she suffers from the alcohol use disorders yes is that based on the history she gave you yes and and she acknowledged herself that she felt her drinking was um problematic for her okay when i asked her if she felt her drinking had been problematic for her she said yes okay and uh, do you have any opinion on the impact that sarah's drinking had on her thinking and behavior on the night of this incident yeah well, I think it certainly affected her, her thought process and behavior. I think they were both drinking. They acknowledged that, and uh, she acknowledged that. Now, in terms of the Sarahs, what impact did Sarah's drinking have in your opinion? If you have one, like what impact did Sarah's drinking have on her thinking, the drinking thinking, and behavior at the time of this event? Well, alcohol disinhibits people, so it probably disinhibited her. I, I don't know what her alcohol level was. They had, I think, two bottles of wine. So what do you mean by the disinhibit? It causes people to, or, or allows people to, do things they wouldn't normally do. So, okay, so the alcohol, in your opinion, may have impacted her thinking and behavior at the time of this event. It may have, but unfortunately for her, it was voluntary intoxication. No one forced her to drink, right? It was voluntary, which isn't a defense, but the alcohol could have affected her thinking and behavior that night. Yes. And generally, you think if it affects people in that they are disinhibited, they would tend to do things they don't normally do. Yes. Anything else you want to say about that alcohol, how it affects her thinking and behavior at the time of this event? No, again, I don't know what her alcohol blood alcohol level was at the time of the incident, so I, I can't tell you whether it did or did not affect her. Okay, okay. And then I know that Sarah, before like before I came on the case, maybe just as I was coming on, she wrote a bunch of letters to the judge and the prosecutor. And do you know, do you have have any clinical conclusions as it relates to her writing all those letters not without having read them okay now on the subject of battered spouse syndrome generally what are the characteristics that are present in an individual suffering from the battered spouses the syndromes what are their characteristics uh, again it, it depends on each individual but it, it typically they are well they can be you know it depends on the abuse so it depends on you know if they're intimidated if they're you know if they use economic abuse against them and try to control them if they isolate them so it depends on each individual and in their response to that but typically they're quiet and meek you know kind of people describe it as walking on eggshells trying to avoid conflict with the abuser Okay, any other general characteristics that you, that, ha that you have that you haven't mentioned relating to an individual? Generally, I, I understand there is specifics, okay? But generally,
generally the characteristics you would find in someone suffering from the battered the spouse the syndrome i mean there are you know statistically there are you know underemployed there are undereducated you know lower educated lower although it crosses all boundaries it is more prevalent in the lower social economic status you know there are there are lots of statistics on that any other characteristics other than what you've mentioned here today that you typically see in someone suffering from the battered the spouse of the syndrome no i think those are the big ones all right okay now within the psychiatric and the psychological community what are the criticisms about the battered the spouse of the syndrome I'm not sure what you're referring to. Well, I would, it, it would seem, okay, in the field, you would have some detractors from this condition. I know it's tied into post-traumatic stress. You're familiar with that. How battered spouse syndrome is tied into the post, the traumatic, the stress. Yes, it, it can be. Okay, now I don't think there is an actual diagnosis in the book you mentioned, the medical book. There is one for the post-traumatic, the stress disorder. Order, but there isn't one for the battered spouse, the syndrome, correct? That's correct. And battered spouse syndrome typically falls under that post-traumatic distress, the disorder. Is that correct? If they meet the criteria, they can qualify for that diagnosis, correct? Okay, okay. And I guess it's just a general question in the field. Okay, have you heard criticisms about forming opinions that someone, somebody, suffers from the battered spouse syndrome or anything about that condition where they think it's, it's not legitimate or that's what I'm getting at? No, I have not. I'm sorry. No. No criticisms? No criticisms. You... I know it's been, it's been in the law, okay? It's been in medicine for several years now. I think Lenore Walker is the one who first developed the theory, correct? I'm not sure. But it's been 20 some odd years or more. Correct. So it's an established, you would agree it's established in the psychiatric, the psychological community that the battered spouse syndrome is actually a syndrome. It's a pattern that we recognize, yes. It's not a diagnosis, correct? Okay, now, as, and as a result of that pattern, the individuals who are suffering from it, I don't want to say they suffer from psychosis, but it's like an altered mental state. They may, some of them. Okay, now have you ever not been allowed to testify as an expert on batter spouse syndrome? No. Or any other field, have you ever not been allowed to testify? No. What is your clinical and treating experience of the battered spouse, the syndromes? Again, we see them. I work in a crisis stabilization unit, so I, I, mean, I see individuals who have, are involved with, say, intimate partner violence on a regular basis. Maybe not every day, but certainly throughout the week. We'll have individuals admitted that are have involvement with intimate partner violence. So how many people would you say you've treated for battered spouse syndrome that you feel qualified for the battered spouse syndromes. Oh, I don't know. Have you ever found that somebody qualified for battered spouse syndrome? Again, it's not a diagnosis, so it's not something that I would document in the medical records. I would document that they were a victim or had been involved in intimate partner violence, which is what we call it. But have you ever, I say, have you ever formed an opinion with a patient that, yeah, this person right here, okay, I understand they've got instances where they've been like a victim of domestic violence, and so either they're coming to you to be treated or they're coming to you in like a crisis type situation okay and you find out that they're part of the reason that they're in the crisis because of them being a victim of the domestic of the violence but in terms of you actually assessing somebody okay seeing somebody that you could be able to actually form an opinion yes i believe this this individual suffers from the battered spouse the syndromes have you ever been able to do that in form an opinion that's the case of any of your prior patients 
No. My opinion would have been that they were suffering from an acute stress disorder, which is the actual diagnosis prior to post-traumatic stress disorder. Secondary to intimate partner violence would have been my opinion. I would not have. Okay, so have you ever testified in court that somebody suffered from battered spouse syndrome? I don't know that I've said those terms. Again, intimate partner violence, and it's not a diagnosis. It's a collection of, you know, symptoms that you identify or report that they identify or or report. Have you ever testified in court before that someone did not meet the criteria for the battered spouse syndrome? No. Again, I don't know that I would have used those words. It's not a diagnosis that I would testify to. It's a group of symptoms. Is it your opinion that Sarah Boone does not suffer from battered spouse syndrome? No. Again, I would have to go through my notes to fully formulate an opinion on that, but I think that she certainly was involved in a violent relationship. But you haven't formed an opinion one way or the other about whether Sarah suffers from the battered spouse syndrome. I think I'd want to go through it, make sure, but I believe that there was a lot of violence in her relationship. She described being threatened. She talked about, you know, the different kind of violent cycle and the different aspects of it. So most likely she does. I, I don't have an issue with that. Okay. Uh, okay now. Now, and then, so to be fair, okay, from, from you know, I, I know you only saw her for like a couple of hours, okay, like two and a half hours, right? Okay, whatever the case may be, okay, and you're trying to, you're trying your best. Okay, right. Okay, you're trying your best, as we all are trying to, you know, do our job. Okay, and I know that you felt like, okay, she's been she's been diagnosed with this anxiety disorder. Okay, and you think maybe it's more adjustment to jail kind of a situation, right? And then you felt like, well, so you you have that opinion, and then you also have the opinion that she tends to meet some of that criteria for the narcissisms. You've said that. Correct. Okay. And then I hear you saying now that she may very well meet that criteria for the battered spouse syndrome, but you may want to look at your notes and like reflect on that a little bit more. Correct. Correct. Are there any other diagnosis besides those three that I just mentioned? Alcohol use disorder we spoke about. Okay. All right. I forgot about that one. And my apologies. Okay. That would be the fourth one. Correct. And that was based on what she told you in terms of her history with the use of the alcohol. That's correct. Any other, any other diagnosis other than those four potentially? No. Okay. And you intend on expressing any other opinions other than what we've spoken about here today? No, I will answer whatever questions I'm asked. Okay. Now, well, I'm asking now. Okay, I mean, you're the expert, right? I'm not, okay? You're the one that's evaluated her, okay? You're the one that's given her the test, okay? I don't know how to feel. I don't know that field like you do, okay? You know the field. I understand you said, hey, 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 hey. I want to think about this some more. I want to review my notes some more to see if, I mean, but in terms of right now, okay, without any further reflection, without any further yes sir reading of the notes any other opinions that you can think you could express in any form or fashion with all this experience almost a thousand jury trial or a thousand trials you've testified as an expert anything else that comes to mind that may be an opinion that you might express in sarah boone's case anything else i'm asked with regards to how our diagnosis come into play with regards to her case i guess what other opinions do you believe you're qualified to express as it relates to Sarah Boone and the fact and circumstances relating to this case. Anything with regards to her diagnosis, I guess. Of those four things that we mentioned, correct. Okay. Are there any other? Is there anything else you want to do on the case other than potentially go back through your notes to reflect on the interview and whatnot? I know we well, we didn't record the interview, did we? Not that I'm not that I was informed of. Okay. Now I should have done that, okay, but we didn't. Other than that, the notes you reviewed that were given to you and then the interview about the testing that you did. Correct. Is there 
anything else that you need. Yes, I believe I'm waiting to review the deposition of the defense expert expertise. Dr. Julie Harper, I believe so, yes. Dr. Michael Brandon, yes, I believe I'm waiting for those deposition transcripts. Would it be important for you to review any of the records, like medical records, anything of that nature? If there's anything that I have not reviewed that is disclosed that I become aware of, I'm happy to review it. What about them jail medical records, if we were to obtain those? Absolutely be happy to review them. Anything else you feel like you would need that you haven't gotten to be able to express opinions in this case that you've mentioned here today? No, because I don't know what else is out there, so no. Okay. Now, you've mentioned forensic work being about 50% of your job responsibilities. Yes, sir. How much income do you make a year on the forensic work? I have no idea. I believe last year, I'm guessing, I want to say last year it was probably 100 to 150 maybe, might be less than 100, that you make on the forensic it work. Correct. And the forensic work, is that a separate income from the salary you make working at the facility? Correct. Okay, now how do they split that up? I mean, how much do you make in terms of a yearly salary at the facility you work at? I'm not sure what my what my salary is in all honesty because it just comes, but it all comes together. So I have my salary, my base salary. I get extra pay for working on the weekends, which I do because we don't have any other physicians to do it. And then my forensic work, the bills are split 65% to me and 35% to the nonprofit. So if you do any forensic work, like on this case, okay, and then the profit of the income you receive, that's split up between 65% to you, 35% to the facility. That's correct. And how are you being paid in this case. What do you mean how am I being paid? Is it is it like court appointed work where you've got a flat fee or is it by the hour? No, it's not court appointed. All right, you're being paid by the state attorney's office. Yes, that's correct. And do you charge by the hour? Typically, yes. What is your hourly rate for the state attorney type work? I want to say I do the I don't do the billing, but I want to say it's like three fifty an hour. And do you know how many hours you have on this case? I do not. Okay, I, I'd have to look. Is there a cap on the number of hours that you can put on a case, or just as much as I need to to be ready to testify at trial? I don't know because, in all honesty, again, I I don't pay attention to that. My assistant deals with the financial and the billing. I just do the work. All right. And I know you're testifying here today. Okay. But it sounds like you may be doing like additional work in terms of reviewing your notes, reflecting on the matter. Yes. And how many hours do you anticipate doing that type of work? It may take me a couple of more hours to go through this. If they actually want me to type a report, that'll take much longer, but they haven't indicated that they actually want to type a report at this point. Now, is it normal is it normal, okay, when you're testifying something like this, okay, that you would need to report? I mean, I know in insanity cases, maybe, and in like competency cases, maybe that you would submit a report, something like this, like for a battered spouse. Is that normal to submit a report? A lot of times I do. The majority of my cases, I submit reports. It's very rare that I don't submit a report. I mean, in all honesty, but I think this case was rushed that in getting her seen and getting to this deposition that there wasn't a report which actually written the report helps me formulate my opinions and get all my ducks in a row with regards to symptoms and pointing out how everything kind of pulls together even for her batter spouse syndrome cases you you submit a report i would say yes okay have you been a been asked to submit a report in this case in the majority of cases, I submit reports. Okay, do you know how you would have been called to handle this case? I mean, why were you selected as opposed to any other person? Maybe in Orlando, you know. Orlando is a pretty big city. You think that they would have found somebody there? Okay, was there some reason that you had some specialized expertise that you were selected Okay, over somebody here locally? I do not. Okay, are you, and I don't know much about this area. You would have to ask them why they chose me. I can't, okay. I'm from I'm from the Peninsacola area, okay? So I'm, I'm not familiar. Are you pretty well known in this geographical area of Orlando, Gainesville? Maybe that was the reason. I do, I, I don't do a lot of small cases here in the Orlando area, but I do quite a few murder trials down there. Other than the couple of hours that you intend to maybe reflect on your notes and anything else, any other work that you have uh, in intended to do on the case. No, sir, not that I'm aware. And you've expressed all your opinions, at least generally, here today. Okay. 
Yes, sir. Is it your testimony at trial? Is that more expensive than the three fifty an hour? I don't believe that it is. In state cases, I don't believe that there that it is. I think it's statutory mandated in all honesty, but they pay. Just double dog sure. Okay. You admit that you have no other opinions other than the ones you express here today that I've been asked about. If I'm asked about something else, that I'll offer it. And you've been provided all the resources you need to rely on and express your opinions. I have based an opinion on the resources that have been provided. If there's any other things out there to be provided that may or may not change my opinion, and you agree, okay, that opinions are subjective, not based on authority, correct? It's based on my years of training and experience, but it's your subjective opinion, correct? Now, Mr. Owens, ma'am, I, I thank you for your time. The witness, yes, sir, thank you. Mr. J, hello, doctor. I if you don't mind, can you turn to the Aspire records that were sent to you? Let me know when you have them. The witness, got it, Mr. J. Now, this is going to be Mr. J speaking now, so that's the state attorney. All right, on the bottom corner of those records, is, is there page numbers? Yes, all right. Yeah, so on page 4, 14, 19, and 26, mine don't have those kind of numbers. Mine has one of one, two of two. Uh, okay. In these records, did Aspire diagnose her with an adjustment disorder and alcohol intoxication? Yes. All right, so that's their diagnosis. And we then had a, that discussion with Miss Boone on Wednesday about some earlier visit to a hospital where there are no records from that they diagnosed her with an anxiety disorder and prescribed her Xanax. Is that not true? I believe I believe it was a hospital. I think it was her primary care physician, if that was she testified to. And actually, I'll go backwards because what they diagnosed her with was an adjustment disorder and alcohol intoxication with a mild use disorder. Okay. So they did use alcohol disorder also. And her blood alcohol levels are what they are in those reports. We don't need to discuss that. Okay. Now, in regards to the anxiety versus adjustment disorder, or both, it seems that there is a past diagnosis for each of those, correct? That's correct. And for you to make a distinction between the two of whatever significance there might be in that distinction, you would just need more time to think about that. Correct. Okay. All right. Now, in regards to trauma, is trauma something that is subjective to the person who is on the receiving end of it? And let me just give you an example. One spouse may come home to another spouse and call her a jerk. And that person that was called a jerk may think that is the end of the world. Cry for a weekend and file for divorce. Whereas another person may brush it off as of nothing. Is that a fair assessment or an example of how trauma works? Yes. Each individual is different with regards to how they perceive things coming at them. So even in a violent relationship, where both people in the relationship may be violent towards one another at different times, does that necessarily mean that they're internalizing that as trauma the way somebody else may or may not? Correct, not necessarily. So just because somebody is in an abusive physical relationship with another person, does that mean that that is leaning towards the criteria of battered spouse syndrome? No, not necessarily. And I don't know that we've talked about it, but is efforts to control another person, is that a component of the battered spouse syndrome for the abuser, not the abusee, not for the victim? So, for example, if one partner has the other partner's identification papers and when it turned them over to that person, is that an element of control showing that the person is trying to exert control over that person that wants their identification papers? Yes. Giving gifts to another person in a relationship. Partner A gives partner B a gift and then still, when it's convenient, considers that to be partner A's property, even though it was a gift to partner B. Can that be an element of trying to exert control over partner B? Yes, it's coercion and a form of well, kind of financial abuse where you're, you know, giving things and taking it away. Is isolation any relevance to the battered spouse syndrome situation? I know it's not a diagnosis, but you know, if partner A is isolating partner B from friends, families, coworkers, does that have any influence on a decision by a healthcare professional, whether this is signs of battered spouse syndrome? Yes, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's one of the symptoms that you see in intimate partner violence. One of the ways of manipulating or controlling someone is isolating them from friends, peers, relatives, how about if partner A is threatening partner B with legal process? 
I don't know, such as arrest or following through with prosecutions. Is that an element of control that could be a criteria for battered spouse syndrome? Yes, again, it's threats and coercion. Okay, so how about tearing the other partner down verbally? Telling partner B that he or she is worthless. I'm the best thing that's ever happened to you. You, you will never do better than me, those sorts of things. Does that have any influence in this battered spouse syndrome arena? Certainly that lends itself to emotional abuse, which goes along, you know, it's not just the physical abuse, it's financial abuse, it's, it can be sexual abuse. It can be, as you're talking about, just different types of abuse. Can a partner in a relationship, even without being subjected to physical abuse, be made to feel worthless and out of control and dependent on the partners that says those things to him or her? Yes. Is there any sort of phraseology or words that describe that when there actually isn't physical violence necessarily, but just the psychological violence, just emotional abuse. And is that a diagnosis in the DSM or is it a fit under PTSD or other trauma related issues? No, it's not a diagnosis. Again, it's something that we would recognize and you may have an adjustment disorder due to that, an acute stress reaction due to that. So it's something that we would identify as one of the stressors that's causing the diagnosis, but it's not a diagnosis in and of itself. Okay, so prior to saying that a particular person has the signs or the recognized criteria for battered spouse syndrome, what, what sorts of things would you like to have as a practitioner besides just a history given by the person that is alleging they were abused? Right, so collateral from other individuals who were familiar with the relationship, medical records that indicate that they have had treatment for different injuries. If there's been physical violence or sexual violence, so police reports. If there's been prior arrest or documents or police coming out to the home, a lot of times they would go to the house in years past but not result in arrest. Sometimes they end up getting Baker acted when there's violence in the home or as opposed to arrested. So any documents that may lay out kind of a pattern of the abuse and turmoil in the relationship. So anything that is not dependent on the credibility of the historian. Correct. So for example, if there is a video, say that exists of partner A, accusing partner B of stealing a car keys, the credibility of that is dependent on the person accusing the other person of stealing the keys, even though there may be other possibilities such as, I don't know, just losing the keys. Correct, or misplacing them, yes, correct. When the historian of abuse has alcohol abuse disorder and gets acutely intoxicated, has narcissistic personality tendencies, even if they may not meet five criteria or whatever it is in the DSM-5TR, are those red flags to take what that historian is saying with grains of salt and require extra corroboration? They are. Oh, yes, they are. Just being in the criminal arena to start with is a red flag that you may want to take everything and kind of cross check everything that you're being told. Now, in particular with the history that Ms. Boone gave us on Wednesday about the date of the offense, I know you were taking notes. Can you can you tell us, starting from when they woke up? I remember that being the question and kind of redirecting to that. Take us through what she said was her day and we can stop. Yes. It'll be a long narrative and we can stop as needed. Okay, so she said that they woke up in the morning and he wanted to drink. She asked him if they could clean the house together in an effort to kind of distract him from that. And she said they cleaned, did the laundry, vacuumed, went out to the back porch where they smoked, drank, and talked. Let me stop you there. Just so that we're clear, and I don't know if we've ever clarified it. On Wednesday, did we take that to mean smoking nicotine versus smoking cannabis or something else? I took it to mean smoking nicotine because she told me that she'd only smoked cannabis three times in her entire life. All right, all right, all right. Go on from there, thank you. So this was about four o'clock in the afternoon by this point because they actually didn't, well, she, she later went backwards. She said she didn't know what time they got up, so it wasn't necessarily morning, morning. So by four o'clock in the afternoon, they had finished cleaning. They were on the back porch smoking, drinking, talking. She couldn't recall if they ate lunch, but he got a bottle of wine. They'd had a half bottle from the night prior, and then they got another bottle of wine. She said they went to Publix together, and then they were on the back porch hanging out, and they had a dart board and two beach chairs out there, and they're just kind of spending time. And then he, well, she said he began thinking about life in general, got upset. She said she was afraid that he, she would get hit and he asked if he wanted to call his daughters. She acknowledged that she knew his daughters would refuse to speak to him when he was drunk. And so that upset him more. Then she thought she would show him her art. Oh, she thought the daughter would show him her artwork. 
But then he eventually called his brother. She said that he was sad and that he seemed to be a turning point for him. And then she said she pushed him and tried to get him to tell his brother that he had pulled her down the stairs the night before. And so I questioned her about that because she said, you know, that she was worried that he was getting upset and she didn't want to upset him. But yeah, she said she was trying to get him to tell his brother that he had done something to her the night before, which seemed like that to me that that would be upsetting, more upsetting for him. And she kind of denied that. So that they stayed outside for a while and then they decided to go inside. She said he was upset and she introduced him, introduced a puzzle and that they were doing and finished it. Then they did some arts and crafts and again she offered that she was trying to unfocus him on hurting her and being upset, although he hadn't done anything at this point. She said that she was entertaining him for herself to be okay. She said it was a normal day for her. She was afraid all day. He was sad and upset. They listened to music, but she doesn't like his music. It's angry rap music about killing and hurting things but he was dancing with the dog and then she said they were sitting on the couch and she said at some point he went to get cigarettes and came home with more wine so at some point he left the home and came back but she wasn't clear where in this lineup that occurred and she said we were both laughing and having a good time and then they were sitting in silence and he said you're it and she said now we have to play hide and seek and she was it so she went upstairs to take a shower while I was hiding and she stayed up there for a while. And then she came down, she got out, she decided it was, it had been enough time. And she got out of the shower and was coming down the stairs and she said there was a suitcase and some clothes that they had gotten out to donate. And they were trying to get that together. And it was on the floor in the living room. And that, as she was coming down the stairs, she saw him kind of slipped into the suitcase as, he, as a hiding place. And she said, I saw him in the suitcase and I zipped him up and we were laughing. She said, then he said he couldn't breathe. And I remembered feeling I couldn't breathe when he was choking me or sodomizing. And I was angry and I shook the suitcase. I lost control of the suitcase and it flipped. She said, my son's baseball bat was right there. He put two fingers on and I hit them with a bat. I know. And she said, then she said, I know. Now I'm definitely going to die. This is what it sounds like. This is what it feels like. I didn't want to leave him face down, so I left him right side up. I felt if he got out, I didn't care if I died. I was tired of it, tired of living in constant fear. I don't want to live like this anymore. She said that she took the video and a photo to show him terror, which because she intended to show it to him the next day, and that's what she said about it. And now, did she indicate that she just felt like there was this generalized fear that she had of physical harm from him throughout the day? Every day? That's what she said, yes. Now, did she describe her relationship as sort of... She was the nurturer who was going to save him? Yes. Throughout her description of the relationship with him, yes. She did everything for him. He would lose his job, she'd go back. She would go, she would go to his boss and beg them to take him back and get his job back for him. So, you know, she was, you know, the kind of link to his family for him. You know, she was kind of this almost like savior kind of presentation with regards to him. Did she ever describe that he tried to isolate her from her family? She did not describe that. Did she ever describe him trying to prevent her from seeing her son and spending time with her son and having her son come over? No, she did not say that he tried to prevent that. Did she, did she describe him ever isolating her from her friends, preventing her from going out and seeing her friends? No, I don't recall her saying that. Did she ever describe that? There were times, however, that he would take her debit card and or credit card and go spend money that she didn't want to be spent. I don't recall her telling me that. And that might have been something that was outside of the scope of your evaluation. Right. During the course of her relationship with George, did she describe that she went to her ex-husband's house as a place of solace to escape the situation with George? Yes. And that night of the incident, did she describe that there was anything preventing her from going to her ex-husband's house or to a neighbor or to anybody else when George was in the suitcase? No. Do people who suffer from abuse disorder or substance abuse disorder other than alcohol? Do people in that situation tend to lie about their use or minimize their use? Yes. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so they teach us that in medical school that it was kind of double what people tell you they use. You should expect that they're actually using double that amount and they'll minimize when you ask them how much they use. That's pretty typical. Okay, and again, you went to the text messages. Did you see anything in the text messages? 
that attributed to the phone number that apparently is Ms. Boone's when the recipient is either George, George's brother, Moy, M-O-I, short Moises, I think describing George in a poor light and saying bad things about George. Yes, and there were times when she's, you know, even texting George and cursing, as I said, putting him down. Did George, again, we're attributing, you know, who's using these handheld devices at any particular time. We don't know that. But in any of the text messages that appear to be attributed as being sent from George, did he ever respond and retaliate and speak with the same tone in the words that she did? No, not that I recall. Okay, and did she in those text messages ever threaten the process of arrest if he or members of his family did not do as she wished? I think. And again, if you know, then that's fine. Yeah, I don't recall specifically. I think there may have been one incident there where that was brought up, and but I don't recall specifically who was involved in the conversation. And as far as controlling identification papers, one spouse or partner doing that to another one, destroying things of value such as identification papers, is that a component of control that you could see in an abusive relationship? Yes, absolutely. I don't think I have any other questions. Mr. Owens, do you have any follow-up? Yeah, yeah, I do, boy. Uh, Dr. Warner, those are good questions by the prosecutor, first of all, okay? And uh, I've asked some questions. Now, it goes to the redirect examination, it says. This is Mr. Owens. Is there anything else you can think of we have not touched on that stands out in your mind that you may need to testify to hear today to let us know every potentiality? Of course, you know we want to know everything, okay? The good, the bad, the ugly, okay? So is there any, I mean, is there any catch-on? maybe that he forgot to mention, I forgot to mention, that you feel like is somehow relevant, material, and important to this case? Not as I sit here today, no sir. That's all the questions I got. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you again if you have any follow-up thoughts based on reviewing your notes and having time to settle in doing that. Even though you work a tremendous amount of hours, please let us know so that I can let Mr. Owens know. Absolutely. Also, I know that I just received Dr. Harper's deposition while we were starting this deposition. So I will get that transcript to you. Then when I get to Dr. Brandon's, I will get that to you. And if you formulate new opinions that you have not already told Mr. Owens about regarding what they said, then please let me know. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. We'll likely have a conversation about that, so we'll know those things. All right, did you want to proofread or waive proofreading your deposition? I'll read, thank you. All right, Madam Court Reporter, email address. The reporter, yes, please. The witness complies. Mr. J, all right, thanks, everybody. The witness, thank you. Mr. Owen, thank you. All right, bye-bye. Now, the rest of it just goes into, like, the, you know, the certification and that stuff and the court reporter and whatnot. So, let's go ahead and talk about some closing thoughts with this. Okay, so, a couple of key components that stick out to me here. Number one, the talk about narcissism and the traits of that and whatnot. Number two, the way that it was outlined all throughout this from all parties involved. Are you, do you have any other opinions outside of this? Both the parties, state and defense, are asking this. If I come up with them, I'll let you know. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Okay, well, I just got their deposition. We'll get this to you, so on and so forth. Then, also in the beginning, when they talk about, well, if this happens, you know, we might have to do the deposition in court or if this happens or whatever. So, take all those thoughts right there and then go back to that court day where she takes the stand and what's his name Owens interrupts for every five seconds will not let her get a word in well there's two things in my opinion going on and remember this is a non-legal opinion here number one her testimony is very damning of Sarah right her testimony paints Sarah as basically the abuser in my opinion while also acknowledging that Sarah Sarah suffered abuse but was also an abuser at the same time right? That's what I take from the, what she's saying, okay? And the questions that the state was asking her and the where, direction he was going with that about the financial abuse, about the emotional abuse, about the control, all this type of stuff, right? We don't have George here to say his side of the story, okay? At all. Now, the talks about narcissism, I mean, pff, come on, right? Of course, the defense doesn't want this information out on the stand. Going through this, 100%, I'm like, this is why he pulled the tactic of constantly interrupting her, right? And again, he's doing his job. He's the defense attorney, okay? Like, I get that. But he doesn't want this to come out because it paints her in a very bad light. Now, obviously, we didn't need, it didn't even matter to me what she got up here and said. Sarah 
nailed her own coffin shot, okay? So there's all those three components going on there. Now also, I have to sit here and say, to be fair, to look at both sides, they all three discuss this whole thing if something else comes out in the stand. So I'm not sure why they all acted like this, and I'm talking about the doctor, the state, and Owens, that this was some big shocker of, now she has different information, here we are in this scenario. First of all, they told you not to do that. The state said they would translate the information. Owen's acting like he never heard from the state. They clearly lined that out that they should have, so who dropped the ball there? Secondly, they knew that they were gonna do this, so Owen coming up in court talking about what? We're gonna have to, oh my gosh, and being all dramatic about it? Well, you already talked about doing the deposition in court if this situation came up, and it did. Now again, I get that there's a lot of theatrics that have to go on with both the state and the defense that play out in the courtroom in these trials. And of course, he's gonna wanna act like, oh my God, and I mean, regardless, even if you talked about it, it's still going to be like, seriously, I have to do that here. But it was discussed here, right? So a lot of this stuff, I'm just like, I don't know why any of these people acted surprised, you know, including the doctor where she was like getting annoyed. And trust me, I mean, I get it. I'm not trying to sit here and like whatever, but it's just like they all, I mean, this is all covered. I think also it comes into play with this and the doctor described it perfectly. This is, and also Owens and the state. This is what happens when someone takes over a case a month before it's going to trial, a five-year-old case, and rushes it through, and all the drama that's been going on, this is what you get. It's just unprepared, right? And so showing up to court and being like, you know, oh gosh, this is happening, that's happening, we know Owens was unprepared. I mean, that was clear, clear as day, okay? Anybody really would be who was willing to take on the case and jump in like this. You know, there's that. So to me, reading this, I'm like, oh, she, as the kids might say, she clocked her her tea. Okay, she clocked her teeth. Okay, she completely summed Sarah up in a very professional way. Narcissistic tendencies, you know, the all the stuff going on with the relationship, the alcohol use stuff going on, all of these contributed to this. And basically the biggest thing that sticks out to me too in this is that you have to take what they're saying with a grain of salt when A, B, and C are present. You have to question, hmm, where, who, look at the source, right? We don't have George's story. George's story is only told through Sarah and the narrative that she tried to form with video, with police reports, with text messages. And a lot of that they're just showing. And like when the doctor said like, yes, yeah, didn't, he didn't bring that same energy to Sarah that she brought to him. Now, am I sitting here saying that George never touched her or anything? No, absolutely not. It's very clear that this was a tumultuous relationship back and forth. But it's almost like a, if you put to, like almost this is how I feel about it. If you put two people together who are being abusive to one another, and when I say abusive, who are creating battered spouse syndrome amongst one another. I don't believe for one second that Sarah was scared every day, like she, the doctor saying that she told her. I don't believe that at all. I don't believe that Sarah was scared that day. I think Sarah ran that household. Why on earth would you record Put your captor, who, who you are afraid of every day that you're gonna lose your life to, why would you put them in a suitcase like that and record it and plan to show it to them? Why would you even do that? Why, if you're afraid for your life and you know that it upsets the person who you're afraid is gonna take your life, do you try and make him call the daughter? These are the things that she let slip through. Please hold. Literally, please hold. Don't believe it for a second at all, zero. This to me, I, I was so excited to read this to hear what the doctor said because we never got a chance. They had to just end it. And now reading this, I'm like, yeah, he got the main talking points in the state. So that's why I'm sure he was like, okay, let's just, we'll rest. You know, they got the stuff out there. It is what it is. So anyways, let me know what you think down in the comment section below. What stuck out to you the most about it, right? I'm very curious. If you're still watching, thank you. I know this is a long video. You probably heard the puppies in the background at times. This was very interesting to film, try and film a long video like this with the boys. Not unattended, but no babysitter, no one else around, no other dogs, whatever. They don't like recording early in the morning. <laughs> they don't like it. They're like, Dad, um, hello, we should be playing or whatever, even though we already had a play session. But anyways, like I said, let me know what you think down in the comment section. Thank you if you're still watching. If you could, drop some little sofas off for myself, Roscoe and Spirit, Bo and Luke, who are now cuddled up sleeping now that we're done recording. They put their show on, they're done. Now, until myself, Bo, Luke, Roscoe, and the Sofa Squad family can meander down to the comment section to sit on those little sofas that you drop and talk about this case and all the other ones we do talk about here at the Sofa Squad. 
We'll see y'all soon. I just wanted to say thank you again for watching the whole video and also thank you for being part of the Sofa Squad. Special thanks to all the Patreon members, channel members from both of my channels, everybody who likes, shares, subscribes, comments in the comment sections. It helps the channel out so much. Now don't forget, I do have that other channel, the podcast channel. That's where we go live, we hang out, we talk. Uh, we have kind of sort of a schedule, but just be sure and check it out. I'll put it up here on the screen. Also, if you're looking for merch, be sure to check out my Teespring store. I'll put that up here. And then like I said in the beginning of the video, if you want to follow me and Roscoe on the Insta, on the gram, on Instagram, go on, check it out. It's right here on the screen again. But once again, thank you very much. I really appreciate you being part of the Sofa Squad and I'll see you in the next video.